Hello everyone and welcome to today's AGI's GeoWebinar series. My name is Leela Gonzalez and I'll be moderating today's GeoConnection webinar, the USGS EDMAP program, training the next generation of geoscientists. This webinar is co-sponsored by the US Geological Survey. Now in today's webinar, we'll be hearing from three speakers who have been involved in the EDMAP program at various levels. Um, they'll be discussing the history, future, and benefits, benefits of the EDMAP program. And the EDMAP program is a matching funds grant program with universities intended to train the next generation of geologic mappers. And it's one of three components of the congressionally mandated U.S. Geological Survey National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program. Now to date, EDMAP has benefited 144 universities and over 850 students from geoscience departments across the nation. Now today we'll be hearing from Randy Orendorf from the um, U.S. Geological Survey. He is the previous Associate Program Coordinator for the National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program at the USGS, and he's now the Director of the Eastern Geology and Paleoclimate Science Center at the survey. And then we'll be hearing from Assistant Professor John Haynes, who's from the Department of Geology and Environmental Science at James Madison University. And then we'll be finishing up with a talk from Alan Helfen, who's a PhD student at the Department of Geography at the University of Kansas. And then after that, we'll follow with a panel discussion where we will be fielding all of your questions. And again, at any time during the webinar, feel free to type your question into your question box on your webinar panel. And to get started, I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to Randy Orendorf here. And Randy, when you're over. When you're ready, we'll go ahead and change the slides on over to you. Hi, I'm Randy Orndorff. I'm a geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey. And for the last eight years, I've had the pleasure of administering the EDMAP program for the National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program. And it's a very exciting program that we want to talk about today, and hopefully you can learn more about it uh, through, through today and even uh, different websites and stuff later. Um, but uh, I want to give you some background about the program itself and how EDMAP benefits the nation. Like uh, most programs and uh, science missions, we have statements of mission that we, we, we uh, follow. And for the geologic mapping program, it's providing the geologic maps and subsurface frameworks. We understand that geologic maps are not just a two-dimensional piece of paper. The importance of a geologic map is also what's beneath our feet. So we look at maps in the subsurface framework that really contribute to the nation in ways of economic vitality, understanding resources. Um, geologic maps are used to understand water resources, mineral resources, energy resources, and also important for understanding hazards. Uh, geologic maps are important for understanding landslide hazards, uh, fault zones for earthquakes, um, and other conditions. Um, as we said, the uh, geologic map is that 3D framework, and that's really what integrates our, our science. A little bit of history, uh, back in the late 80s, uh, the Congress realized that only about 20% of the United States had detailed geologic maps. And these geologic maps, about 1 to 24,000 scale, were important for these various issues. So in 1992, the National Geologic Mapping Act was passed, and since then we've been uh, reauthorized several times. Recently, Congress reauthorized the geologic mapping program for another 10 years from 2009 on. As the geologic mapping program began in 1992, it was 1996 uh, that the very first year that EDMAP was funded with uh, and funding the students across the country to uh, train that next generation of geologic mappers. The geologic mapping program has three components to it, and see where EDMAP fits in here. We have the FEDMAP, which is US, about 30 US geological survey geologic mapping projects across the country that uh, straddle state boundaries and look at federal issues. We have a component called state map. This is a matching dollar for dollar program that we send to state geological surveys uh, to help them um, uh, guide their geologic mapping within their states. And the reason I bring these two components up is EDMAP is very effective when the training and of the students and the universities link to the state map and fed map projects. So EDMAP is basically training our next generation of geologic mappers. We definitely need geologic mappers into the future. 
we're, geologic mapping program is definitely a very national program. We have one component of the three um, in every single state, Hawaii being the only exception. But we do, uh, we do see this as a national program and helping each other out through the various components. As I said before, only about 20% of the nation had detailed geologic maps at about 1990. Through this program now, as you can see from this slide here, the darker areas are where we have completed geologic maps at 1 to 24,000 to 1 to 100,000 scale. So uh, you can see now we're about 50%. There's still a lot of country to cover and a lot of interesting geology. The uh, EDMAP program itself, what are we looking for? Well, the, the time for an EDMAP uh, project is one year. You, the student works with a mentor in the university for that year to deliver and put together a geologic map. I put here what are the typical things that come on a geologic map. But the, the point I want to make here is from the time you get funding as a professor uh, to the time of the end of the funding in one year's time, the student would be producing a geologic map. And these days, most of the time, they are digital geologic maps. So the objective is really to get the students in the field. Uh, we really want them to learn and understand field methods. And these are important things. We're already finding that industry and uh, government surveys are really looking for students that have uh, field experience. Uh, it's a matching program, which means every federal dollar that comes from the USGS is matched by the university. And this is usually done by the professor's salaried time. So time is money, basically. So the time that a professor works uh, with a student would be would be a proper match. And there are many other things that to use for match from the, uh, from the universities. It's a competitive grant process. As you'll see in a few minutes, we get varied numbers of uh, proposals each year, but they do compete, and the best proposals uh, get funded. And as I said before, it's integrated with the federal and state components of our program. We find that the mentoring process uh, is very important when you actually include geologists from the USGS and the state geological surveys in the field at times with the students. On a yearly average, we fund about 65 students from 40 universities. And so since 1996, the first year of funding, we have funded about 850 students from 144 universities, which we're very excited about. Uh, the maximum funding for a graduate student is $17,500 from the USGS. So if that's matched, obviously you're talking about a $35,000 project. Maximum funding for an undergraduate student is $10,000. As I said, it is a competitive grants, uh, grant process. We have a panel that meets in January of each year to process the, uh, the, 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 the proposals. Uh, we have university representatives, we have uh, scientists from the U.S. Geological Survey, and we have state geologists that all sit on this panel. Just to give you an idea of a yearly um, cycle, the, the panel meets in January. At that point, the, we determine who will be funded, and letters go out of those awards. Projects can start anywhere from uh, March 15th until September 15th. We realize that different parts of the country have different climates, so some folks may need, be, need to do their field work in the summer times, others in the spring and fall, so we can, we can accommodate that. From the time that you start your project, you have one year to actually deliver a draft geologic map. I understand as a geologic mapper myself how difficult it is to put together a geologic map. So in one year's time, we do understand that we're generally going to get a draft map at that time. The uh, link to the state surveys and the USGS is important because we do not fund publications of the geologic maps. Uh, that's where we hope the state surveys and USGS can step up and help the students get to that point. For 2010, uh, we had uh, requests for over $1 million from the universities. I think we had 60 or 57 proposals this past year, requesting over a million dollars. We had available just over a half a million, 566,000. So with those funds, we were able to award 32 projects from 31 universities. And this is a total of 61 students in the field. 24 of them are graduate students, and 37 are undergraduate students. Um, the, the projects are a little bit different. The graduate students are usually doing geologic mapping that are specific to a thesis or a dissertation. 
the undergraduate students are generally looking at a very detailed geologic mapping project. Uh, we have we really think this has been a very successful program. Uh, over the years, as I said, about 850 students have been trained. And uh, we have done a survey where we have um, connected with about 400 of our former students. We connect with them about three years after they complete their project to see um, how successful they are, what they were doing. 95% of the students that have gone through EDMAP have either gone on to further geoscience degrees or have received jobs in the geoscience field, which is very exciting. Uh, through the years, we've got the, the funding aspects. It's generally been uh, just from 2000 on between four and five hundred thousand dollars, but you can see that it has increased um, over the years to over five hundred thousand. So we're seeing this upswing. Um, this slide here shows the um, comparison. The blue line on top is the amount that had been requested over the years and the uh, pink or red line in the bottom is how much we've had available. We sure like to see that slope continue to go upwards because we can fund more and more projects across the country. Um, over the years, by the way, we have, um, since 1996 on, uh, we have uh, funded, uh, put out more than $6.8 million across the country. So if you look at that, it's nearly $14 million that have gone that has gone into geologic mapping projects when you add the matching funds to it. Uh, this slide just shows you that right now the, um, the program for 2011, EDMAP program for 2011 is open. Um, you can get some information from the NCGMP website. Uh, but more importantly, if you go to grants.gov, if you're interested in applying for an EDMAP grant, the program announcement, which is a very detailed announcement on what you need to do to, to apply for EDMAP, is there. All you have to do is go to grants.gov and search on EDMAP. And I sure hope that, uh, that we get the, a large amount of proposals this year and get some more students in the field next year. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, we're going to go ahead and move along to John Haynes, who will be talking about one of his projects that he's been doing. So. All right. Well, uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, again, I'm John Haynes from James Madison University in Virginia, and I've had students working with me and a colleague out in the uh, Valley and Ridge of Virginia in Highland County. Uh, we've been mapping the north half of the Williamsville seven and a half minute quadrangle. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is the, what I see as a lot of the, the, the difficulties that we had, but some of the benefits to our students that came from this work, and a little unique aspect of it, which is that we've also got access to some very good stratigraphic exposures, but they're underground in caves and on road cuts. So uh, we start with the next slide there, Leela, and uh, what we uh, where we are, I should say, is up in the uh, sort of the north, the western part of the Valley and Ridge, uh, and uh, mostly in Highland County. Uh, the picture right there at the center is of a very good cliff exposure of part of the Helderberg group and the, the uh, carbonate sequence there uh, of the upper part of the Helderberg group from the Kaiser limestone up to the Corriganville limestone. And uh, it's also entrances to a couple of the caves right there. So that's actually in the mapped area. If you go to the next slide, what we've got, what happened, of course, is this is the Appalachians. And uh, we had to figure out a lot of the stratigraphy uh, turned out that what was thought to be some of the stratigraphic sequence we, I didn't agree with. And so, of course, we've also gone and looked at exposures that are in the periphery in other quadrangles, such as this one, which is a, a nice long exposure uh, on US 250, Highway 250, where we have contacts of the Tenalaway and Kaiser formation. So I'm going to talk today just a little bit about these two formations in particular and how it, uh, uh, getting an understanding of the stratigraphy of these units uh, with my students has turned out to be the real key to getting the mapping uh, in, in the quadrangle, uh, getting it to where we think that we're doing the, a good job with it now. Uh, so next slide. And uh, what we're, uh, 
what we've been able to do is here's the stratigraphy of two very uh, important areas. The, the strat column there at the upper center left is in our mapping area in, in the Williamsville quadrangle. Uh, the red star, the white stars and the red circles there are sort of new findings that have come of, of, of uh, all of our field work during the past year and a half, really, uh, to do this project uh, since last summer of August of, of 2009, really. And the section on the right is that section up on the highway on US 250. But the, the uh, uh, very significantly in the center there, you have the one single star on the column uh, right by the Clifton Ford sandstone. And over on the right column, there is no Clifton Fords. There's the Big Mountain Shale. And those are facies related. And it turns out that it was the identification of the, the, the existence of several additional sandstones in the Tanalaway Formation. Because these sandstones will outcrop as weathered, rubbly beds up on the mountaintops and on the sides of the mountain. But we didn't know which ones we were looking at. They're all calcarinaceous sandstones. It turns out they're very similar looking when they're very weathered. So the, the, the real key to understanding if we were looking at Tanalaway or if we were looking at Kaiser, that came from the additional work that we put into this, that figuring out the stratigraphy. And as you'll see, actually, I don't even have the Corrigan bill up there, so these need to be updated. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's an ongoing process. Uh, but the figuring out that the Tanalaway formation has about six or seven sandstones in it uh, that, uh, that were not recognized by any previous mappers in this area it turned out to be the, the real key to understanding then the rest of the stratigraphic sequence. So go to the next slide, please. And uh, these uh, exposures in the caves of this area because there's some interest also, a lot of interest in the stratigraphy as it governs the hydrogeology. And this is a fascinating image here because we've got some pretty integrated cave systems. And we've marked on this, my student did all this, uh, marked on this from, from our various trips into the cave uh, where some of the key stratigraphic contacts are and where they're located and we've got a lot of pictures. And so uh, next slide, please, is a uh, view here of, of the same map without all the detailed text on it, but with a lot of pictures, both, uh, both on the surface, as you can see in the upper right, and at the, at the center left there, uh, the cliff above the uh, couple of the cave entrances, but also as we were puzzling out what, what it was we were looking at in the, uh, in, in the cave. So this gave the student sort of a, a very different opportunity to see uh, what otherwise in the Appalachians is, is, is it's tough to get good exposures. But this was also very useful and very important for the stratigraphy as we were trying to figure all of this out, that we had access to these, uh, to these cave exposures. So next slide, please. Uh, what will what I want to do, as I said, is to is to focus on the real uh, the, the the important part of the stratigraphic column where there was the most confusion, and that was really to define what is the Tanalaway formation, what is the Kaiser formation, uh, because until we could do that, we really didn't have the ability to go out on the ridge tops, on the sides of the ridges and put the stratigraphic contacts down with any sense of accuracy. We just didn't know. And so trying to then identify, define, differentiate these two units, we started with a literature search and also just getting out and looking at what did we see. And could we see what these earlier geologists had seen back 60, 80 years ago and then up into the more recent times as well. So that's what we started with, was to try to figure out, could we tell ourselves what some of the distinguishing characteristics were? So next slide, please. And as we do this, I'll start with the Tanalaway, which is the, which is the older of the two units. Uh, but we, ha we do have many good exposures in the area. Some of those are listed here to the right specifically. But some of the, again, we, we, we 
pretty soon, by about last, uh, really last fall, we began to realize that there were a lot more sandstones in the Tanalaway that had not been identified and that these were being and had been confused for, in some cases, decades with the Clifton Ford sandstone in the Kaiser. And so figuring this out took us quite a bit of time and a lot of time in the field, but it was all time well spent. So the top picture shows the Clifton Ford sandstone and outcrop, uh, very distinctively cross-bedded. It's a calcarinaceous sandstone. The bottom picture shows some ripple mark, uh, some really some molds of ripples in the in, in a sandstone in the Tanalaway formation. Uh, next slide, uh, please. And this one shows that we've also made uh, use of thin sections because one of the ways that we can tell these apart and this is also good for the students to understand that field mapping is also linked very closely to uh, petrographic analysis of samples. So uh, just, I, I think I have one other thin section, but the, the, the example here shows that there are calcareous grains, in this case uh, echinoderm fragments with the syntaxial overgrowths in an otherwise uh, quartz sandstone with, with abundant quartz overgrowths. And uh, this is a characteristic petrographic appearance of one of these Tanalaway sandstones. So next slide, please. And uh, then this image here shows that one of the first things that we did was to take our observations and combine those with the previous studies and the descriptions from previous studies. Uh, and so we sort of defined for ourselves, this will all go into the, the, to the legend of our map, of uh, what is the Tanalaway formation, what are its characteristics. And so we have now identified that the Tanalaway has uh, actually three members, an upper, a middle, and a lower member. The upper and lower members have this very characteristic thin-bedded, thinly laminated appearance with numerous fractures. As you can see in both of these, one picture on the left is from a cave and the one on the right is from an outcrop. Uh, next slide, please. And those fractures are very characteristic. And then this shows that they're in the lower member, uh, very characteristic reddish pink sort of partings that are a little bit siltier, but they give a very characteristic appearance. The, the, the lime mudstone is black, and these very characteristic red partings, again shown in a cave on the left and on the outcrop on the right, where we see those red black sort of red black partings. Of course, on an outcrop, the limestone whether it's a blue color, but next slide, please. And that's a, that's a very characteristic lithology of the lower member of the Tanalaway. Throughout the lower and upper members, uh, and especially in certain parts of the lower member, we've got some uh, fossiliferous horizons, and they're very characteristically either ostracods or they are gastropods. These are some ostracods here. That's a hand sample on the left with a couple of thin photomicrographs there from thin sections. And, uh, and this become, has become a very characteristic lithology that we're able to identify uh, now relatively quickly. Next slide, please. And so those, those are, but those are a very uh, low diversity assemblage of fossils. And that's in contrast to the middle Tanalaway. And that contact on the left picture there shows the lower Tanalaway at the far left and then the contact with the middle Tanalaway. And the middle Tanalaway is a much more massive unit, which has a much more uh, diverse and abundant uh, marine fauna, not the more restricted fauna of the lower and, and upper members. It's got crinoids. You can see a big crinoid stem there by the, the DNAG scale there. And also, the middle member, uh, we realized last year that the middle member had been confused with the Kaiser limestone. And figuring that out uh, was really important as well uh, for our mapping purposes. Next slide, please. And the, uh, the, the key uh, that separates both the lower and middle and the middle and upper members is the identification of the, the presence of these sandstones. On the left, there is the sandstone delineated at the entrance to one of the caves, and on the right, here is the sandstone on one of the road cuts. And again, it's weathering out. It's calcarinaceous, so it's weathering lots of secondary porosity there. 
uh, even buggy porosity as you can see there. And this on a weathered outcrop or up on the hillside on the top of the ridges, it, it was just very difficult to tell one from another. And there, there are several of these. So it became very difficult early on. We've, we have figured this out. Uh, and next slide, please. And these sandstones are very now very recognizable. Here uh, we are with some of my students at an exposure that, uh, again, a different sandstone on the left is shown uh, with the lines there. And we're, we're looking at it at an exposure. And then on the right, I've got one of my students with another uh, uh, geologist from the Virginia Speleological Survey who has a lot of interest in this as well. But my student is, is sitting on a, one of the sandstone ledges. So we were able to get samples, and again, uh, if we go to the next slide, please, that um, this particular, these, these sandstones here turned out to be, uh, had not been recognized before as being in the Tenalaway. In fact, those two in that previous slide have for 55 years been, been thought to be the, uh, in the Kaiser, the Clifton Forge sandstone. So we figured, uh, got, got all that figured out. Uh, another lithology that's, that's not that common, but it's important when we find it, are flat pebble conglomerates, or intra intraclastic uh, grain stones and pack stones. And here's a couple examples here of some flat pebble conglomerates in the Tenalaway. Uh, next slide, please. And so those are also very uh, uh, characteristic. All right, so those, those are just a few of the observations about the Tenalaway formation, which in this area is overlain by the Kaiser limestone. The Kaiser is most characteristically perhaps identified by these reefs, these stromatocrid-rich and, and coral-rich reefs. And, and here on the left is an exposure in the uh, gorge of the Bull Pasture River, and there it is in one of the caves. The next slide, please. This. Um, uh, the Kaiser is also characteristically has cross bedded uh, units in it on the left. Though that's a, a crinoidal grainstone with a little bit of quartz sand on the right. We have more of a again a sort of a, an arenaceous limestone with some cross bedding. Next slide, please. And those are also very useful for distinguishing the contacts. Then the middle member of the Kaiser is what changes facies in our area from the Big Mountain Shale uh, to the north to the Clifton Ford Sandstone in the Williamsville Quadrangle, and that's what you see there on the right. Uh, both of these are uh, well exposed. For the Appalachians, they're well exposed. Uh, and uh, Next uh, slide, please. So figure we these this was known that the, the Clifton Forge was a facies of is a facies relation to the Big Mountain Shale. And here we are in the gorge of the Bull Pasture River, and that, that line is showing the contact between the Clifton Forge sandstone to the left and the uppermost ledges of the Tenalaway Formation to the right. That the Clifton Forge, we have now found, directly overlies the Tenalaway, whereas where the Big Mountain Shale is present, it is, there is a lower member of the Kaiser, which is, which is not present down in, this, in the Williamsville Quadrangle. We have the the Clifton Ford, which is the middle member of the Kaiser, overlying the Tenalaway. So next slide, please. This was a, also a very important discovery that we made last winter. And so the, the stratigraphic contact then is something that we've, and there it is, the little uh, reduced version of that, first, of that photograph. But also we've, we've got a, a, a contact exposed in one of the caves in the area. And it, it appears to be an erosional contact and that in places there is a flat pebble conglomerate that varies in thickness from being absent to being almost uh, one and a half meters thick over a lateral distance of just a few tens of meters. So that uh, is, is also a brand new discovery, never mentioned, never noticed before. Next slide, please. And <clears throat> this contact then which is uh, seen here on the left, where it's exposed on the road cut along US 250, where we see the massive crinoidal grainstones of the lower Kaiser up at the top, then the flat pebble conglomerate, and then the platy, thinly laminated, thin bedded limestones, very fine grained mudstones and wax stones of the Tenalaway. The flat pebble conglomerate there is just a, a few centimeters thick. 
in the in one of the caves of this beautiful exposure right there on the right of the Tenalaway with those typical rectilinear fractures. Then we've got several tens of centimeters, in this case maybe 20, 20 or so centimeters of the flat pebble conglomerate overlain directly by the Clifton Ford sandstone. And that have, we, we had to figure out which sandstone that was. But with the reefs and the Kaiser uh, and our, our better improved knowledge of the stratigraphy, we were able to do so. So next slide, please. Uh, that, um, that gives us now the ability to make correlations between these areas. And so I, I don't have a, any of our geologic map because that's what we're in the process of drafting up right now. But, but now that we figured out our stratigraphy, and as I said, the, this is still needs to be updated because there's a unit, the Corriganville limestone, that I don't have shown here. But we, now that we're able to recognize the significance of the sandstones in the Tanala Way, that the Clifton Ford sandstone is present, but it is uh, correlative as, as, as known prior with the, with the uh, big mountain shale and that in the uh, mapping area that the lower Kaiser member, uh, member is not present. Those, are all, those have all been very significant discoveries which uh, with the help of my students uh, we've been able to really nail this down and our mapping uh, is now in the process of being finished. It's, just, it's great because it's made such a difference. And I believe that's the last slide, uh, Leela. And so uh, that's, that's my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. And appreciate your presentation here. And we'll be turning over the slides now to Alan. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Alan Halton. I'm a PhD student at the University of Kansas in the Department of Geography. And today, I hope to share some of my experiences with the EDMAP program. Um, from my point of view as a student who's been involved with the program. To begin, the EDMAP program, as well as the state map program, has had a rich history at the University of Kansas, and several students have had the opportunity to work on a variety of different uh, EDMAP or state map projects. Uh, two of these projects are pictured here, and, and it's just an example of students who are out in the field uh, conducting some form of mapping on some of the bedrock in their specific situation. Now my experience with the EDMAP program uh, is somewhat unique because not only have I served as a, a student who's worked on an EDMAP project, but I've also served as a student mentor to other students who are working on an EDMAP project. And today I hope I'm going to share some experiences uh, from both of those standpoints, uh, again with me being a student who's actually worked on a project and a student who has oversaw and met, helped mentor other students working on, on an EDMAP project. Quickly, I just wanted to go through uh, the EDMAP projects that I've been involved with. Uh, the first project was in 2009, and this was a project that looked to map, uh, uh, map uh, dune, dune sediments along the Arkansas, or excuse me, map the Arkansas River dune field in south central Kansas. Uh, this pictured here is the dune field. Uh, in the top, you can see in the top left, there is a picture of the dune field where we have stabilized dunes. In the bottom is a picture of the dune field where we have active dunes. And the reason we're interested in, in mapping this dune field is because dune fields on the Great Plains uh, can serve as proxies for, for drought because they're sensitive to changes in moisture, specifically uh, when a dune field uh, undergoes extreme uh, drought conditions, they activate. And so if we can date and map this activation, we can then get an idea of what was going on in the past in terms of climate. Uh, so specifically with this project, we're again interested in the distribution of the Eolian sediments. We're also, also interested in mapping the specific geomorphology of individual dune forms. Uh, we're also interested in gathering chronological data, taking samples, getting ages from those samples so that we had an idea of when the dunes were active. And then finally, we also wanted to gather some geochemical data as well. Sorry here. Cut off the... Apologize. Um, the first thing that we did with this project that was perhaps uh, one of the most interesting things that I've done um, as a graduate student was we took a, a small aircraft low-altitude flight over the area. And this was great for me 
um, to see the dune, dune field and actually uh, get a different perspective on the area that I was going to be working in and that I was going to be mapping. Um, and it, again, this was really one of the most exciting things that I've done while working on one of these projects. Um, as Randy discussed before, one of the things that I think is key to the EdMap, any EdMap project, is some element of field work. And so the majority of the work on this project was in, involved me in the field. And so this is a picture of me with a bucket auger in which we're coring down into the dune, uh, documenting the stratigraphy, and then taking samples. Uh, again, it, it was mentioned earlier in the talk, not only is field work important, but tying that field work into some sort of laboratory analysis is also important. And so uh, this project had all of these elements combined. Now, as a preliminary re report, we submitted this map uh, to the EdMap panel last spring. And in our preliminary map, uh, we were able to map the distribution of Aeolian sand along the Arkansas River. And then for four quadrangles, we were able to map individual dune geomorphology as well as collect over 20 optically stimulated luminescence samples that we were then able to get ages from. And these ages provided us with the preliminary chronology of when the dune field was actually active. And so this map at the bottom, again, is our, is our deliverables, our preliminary deliverables, deliverables. And here is our dune sediment. And these maps at the bottom, these individual maps, the white lines are mapping the individual dune geomorphologies. And then with that, we have the ages of when these dunes were active. Now, the second project that I've been involved in, where I've been a student mentor towards other students who are working on this project, aimed at mapping and documenting alluvial stratigraphy along the Kansas River in Kansas. Uh, now, within this project, we were interested in actually documenting stratigraphy of four alluvial terraces that have been historically documented along the river, but not much is known about them. And so the primary objective of this was to document that stratigraphy, then map the, those terraces, uh, find where are they located within the river valley. Along with that, we're also interested in gathering some chronological data on the alluvial terraces. And then finally, we're interested and also creating a bedrock map of the Kansas River Valley. And so the pictures here are just simply uh, showing the area that we were working in. Here are some stabilized sand dunes that are actually located on the oldest of the alluvial terraces. And then this is a picture of one of the students that was working on this project, Scott, and he's taking a look at some of the bedrock that outcrops in the area of the Kansas River. Like the other project, this project uh, relied heavily on field mapping and field work. Uh, and because we're interested in documenting stratigraphy of these terraces, uh, we had to get down into the terraces some way. And so we used two methods primarily to get down and document stratigraphy. Uh, the first of the method, bucket augering, hand augering, um, took a lot of effort. And there's Scott with the bucket auger uh, going down into the terrace. Uh, we also used a hydraulic coring machine to take cores. Um, and as you can see from this picture here on the bottom left is that even though we had a coring machine do some of the work for us, uh, the students still were able to use their muscles to try and extract some of the cores uh, from the pipes that were used at times. We also hope in the future to use a rotosonic uh, coring machine to not only go down through the terrace sediments, but also go into the bedrock and document uh, the stratigraphy in the bedrock as well. Thus far, this project, uh, with this project, we've documented uh, the stratigraphy of each of the, the terraces. We've also mapped each of the alluvial terraces uh, within the river. And with that data, together with uh, high-resolution LIDAR imagery of the Kansas River and uh, water well logs, uh, the students have been able to produce a 3D bedrock of the Kansas River Valley. And so what you're looking at is, is one of the uh, preliminary outputs of this project. And again, it's a 3D bedrock map of the Kansas River Valley. Um, and so the students are currently working on refining this map and adding, uh, adding layers of the alluvial terraces to this map. And so uh, the end result is we hope to provide lots of 3D images uh, with this mapping project as well. Now, in terms of the benefits, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is how did the EdMap project actually benefit me specifically? Uh, well, it benefited me in several ways, and I have a few of them listed here. 
Uh, but first and foremost, uh, the EDMAP project was a way to introduce me as someone who was new to Kansas to the regional geology of the area. And so uh, just simply being involved in the project was a way to introduce me to a new area of geology. Uh, it was also a great quantity, uh, quality field-based study, something that uh, the project was well-defined. I was able to, to step into go out in the field, do a field project, and actually produce some results. Uh, most important to me, and actually most important to my uh, future research, is this project really introduced me to a new method, uh, some new me research methodologies. Uh, specifically, I've been uh, working with a laboratory at Kansas State where I'm actually running my own optically stimulated luminescence samples. I'm doing all the lab work myself, and it's a collaboration that started from this EDMAP project that's allowed me to do that. Um, similar to that, the EDMAP project I was involved in uh, really was a starting point for my own research. And my own dissertation re research has taken off from this EDMAP project. Um, and I hope to use a lot of the EDMAP project as part of my dissertation research. Um, it's also helped me to link geological mapping to my research. And then finally, perhaps a selfish reason, but working on the MEP project has helped me build my CV, and I've been able to give presentations both at regional meetings and at national meetings on the project I'm doing. And so in a selfish way, it's helped me build uh, those uh, research points on my CV. As a student mentor that's uh, looking at the project from an outside and how it affects other students, I think there are some really specific things that that the EDMAP project really does well for students. And the first thing is it teaches students new field and laboratory techniques that they may not be exposed to in the classroom or may not even be aware of. Uh, the second thing is I think it gives an opportunity for students uh, to assume leadership roles. An example of uh, this past summer working with the students um, where, uh, you know, one person maybe couldn't be around during the day, so the other person had to step up and assume that role. And so it, it provided an opportunity for students uh, to take that. Um, the critical, uh, it, it allowed uh, the students the opportunity to, to think critically and solve problems. And um, as everyone's aware with field research, there comes times when perhaps equipment breaks, and we actually had quite a few uh, uh, situations this summer where the students had to think critically about some problems and actually overcome those problems and it was a great opportunity for them. The students were able to build professional relationships, not, not only with themselves, uh, but with landowners, uh, other colleagues uh, within the university system. Uh, and it was a great way for them to build those relationships. Uh, the students also really took this project added their own ideas and their own creativity and molded it into their own project. Um, and so it was a great opportunity for students to sort of explore um, their own thoughts uh, that were going around in their head and, and incorporate those thoughts into the project. And then finally, it was a great place for students to have fun uh, conducting and exploring new areas of geological research. Now finally, and perhaps most importantly, uh, EDMAP students have user experiences to help them in their future educational and professional lives. And it, me as an example, I know that I will use my experiences with the EDMAP program uh, as I pursue a job as a professor at a one-tier research uh, university. Uh, in terms of other uh, EDMAP students that have worked on, on projects here, uh, uh, Richard, for example, I know uh, when he uh, it goes into the job in the private industry, he'll use his experience. Uh, Karen is a new master's student at geology who's worked on an EDMAP project, and I know she uses that experience in her everyday uh, classwork and research. And finally, Scott will be using uh, his experience as he uh, works on an internship with the Army Corps of Engineers. And with that, that's all I have. Great. Thank you so much, Alan. That's really good to see what... Um perspectives from a student that's been involved in EDMAP. And what we'll do next is we're going to go ahead and move into our panel discussion. And we do have some questions coming in from the audience. So as a participant, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and type them into your question box on your webinar panel at the moment. And we'll go ahead and start fielding questions at, at this time. Um, the first really is more a general question that we've, we've gotten from our audience. 
and um, Alan and John and Randy have gone ahead and unmuted you. Um, but this, this is a question about participation rates of undergraduate versus graduate students um, in EDMAP projects. I know, Randy, you showed in your slides that in 2010 there were about 24 graduate students and 37 undergraduate students that had been funded. Um, is that pretty typical to see higher amounts of undergraduate students in these projects, or does that vary over time? No, that's kind of changed over the years. In the very beginning, um, EDMAP was only open for the first few years to graduate students. Um, then uh, this, uh, through, through discussions with the state geological surveys, we realized that it was important for students who had um, all the necessary uh, courses, stratigraphy, structure, paleo, things like that, as uh, juniors and undergraduates who had gone maybe to field camp also, that they could earn a lot of uh, experience. So um, it, over the years, it's generally been um, probably over the life of the program at least two-thirds uh, graduate students. Uh, however, we are seeing more and more undergraduate projects just over the last three or four years. Great. Um, Question for John and Alan. How did you become aware of the EDMAP program? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, uh, this is John. Uh, I uh, have a colleague. Uh, when I came to J uh, James Madison uh, four, uh, three summers ago, uh, he had already uh, been doing some mapping with it. Uh, so I knew about the, uh, that's how I learned more about the EDMAP program. But it, back in 2001, I had actually done a little bit of uh, work with the West Virginia Geological Survey on some of their state map work uh, in this same area near where I'm working today. So I was very, I knew, and I knew about the, uh, the Congressional Act back uh, 15 or so years ago, but uh, I didn't know the details of it uh, until I really started chatting with my colleague uh, at JMU. So that's how I learned about it. And Alan? Uh, I was uh, introduced to the EDMAP project through my advisor. Uh, who had first approached me about ideas of uh, possibly some mapping that I had wanted to do uh, related to, to my research. Um, and then my advisor had submitted a proposal. The proposal was funded. And that's, that's how I then got involved with the program. Alan, I know you covered in your talk a little bit about the, uh, actually quite a lot about the benefits that you've derived and some of the students that you've been involved with have derived from the EDMAP program. Um, do you, do you and Randy and John, do you all find that these are very typical experiences of students both at the undergraduate level and graduate level um, finding benefits from the EDMAP program in the way of publications, networking, future careers? Are there any other specifics that you've seen that have come up that are pretty unique to what you find within the EDMAP program and the skills that the students gain, how they are able to use those in their future career decisions? Um, well, I think uh, uh, first to jump in, in in my experience with um, with me personally is yeah yes I've been able to uh, to present my research uh, that I've worked on this on the EDMAP project at conferences and whatnot but I also hope to uh, at least uh, get at least one and and maybe uh, even a couple of papers out of this project as it as a re this project relates to all my overall uh, dissertation research in in terms of uh, viewing or watching other students work on this project, I think even in a summer of field work, you can see a progression of the students sort of um, going into a project, perhaps not knowing what to expect, and then by the end of the summer, really sort of taking a hold and and really almost uh, you know leading the project themselves based on what they've they've learned over the summer. Yeah, this is Randy. Um, uh, Alan's exactly right, and we've seen well a couple things. Uh, since the students get a lot of exposure to scientists within the USGS and the state geological surveys, it leads to internships. And for a lot of folks, we have a lot of EDMAP students who are working for the USGS and for the state geological surveys these days. But even experiences that you get thrown into, uh, anecdotally, we had a student several years ago who um, had to go to Iraq as part of the uh, National Guard and uh, who had EDMAC experience. Once his uh, commander found out that he had had that experience, he was a leader in the, uh, the mapping aspects and the um, that the uh, Army was dealing with at that point. So that was kind of an interesting way. You get thrown into things that may not necessarily think that the, the experience is going to help with, but it does anyway. 
Uh, this is John. I, I'd say the one thing I'd just add right off the top, just thinking about it, is I, and James Madison, we're just undergraduates. But I, what I, one of the things I really like about it is the, uh, it forces the students to really have critical thinking and sort of abstract thinking about really about classic geological problems. I, stratigraphy is not one of the more, I think, often intuitive parts of geology. You really have to stretch your brain around this. And so I really like that because we throw in the structural complexities of the valley and ridge around here and we get students just puzzling out problems uh, that they're impressed and we're impressed that they eventually can do it. So I, I throw in the critical thinking aspect. Great. A question about the undergraduate specifically, um, and I think this is relating back to Alan and John's talks. Um, if the students are undergraduates, at what point in your geology programs do the students acquire the critical level of geological knowledge, such as the types of coursework, the average year, you know, are they sophomores or juniors? What is the skill set or the prerequisites, if you will, for undergraduates getting involved in these EDMAP programs? Uh, this is Alan. And, and John, maybe you'd be able to talk more to the uh, what you look for in a student that, that works. I know the students that, that I've worked with, they have been um, upperclassmen, uh, junior, senior level uh, undergraduate students. Yeah, let me just add to that that at, at James Madison, uh, I've worked with students that are sophomores. I sort of take the big picture approach that, okay, a student hasn't had stratigraphy. Well, you know what? The better, a better way to learn it and be prepared for when they do take it is to go out with me or my colleague, Steve Whitmire, and see what we're doing. And then they learn stratigraphy by doing it. And I actually feel that that's been very, uh, very helpful for the students. Uh, the same with structural geology, that, that uh, we go out and it becomes a you know, it becomes a teaching moment that lasts for an entire year, really, because the the student uh, doesn't have all the courses, but they become even a better mapper and a better they get a better understanding of it by the time they're a junior or a senior. So I've actually really had uh, a great, I think, success bringing in students after they've had you know a course in historical and maybe mineralogy, and then they start going out in the field and they just learn by doing the field work. And so, yeah, it's, 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 it works for us at the undergraduate level to start them even as, the, as sophomores. And a question for all of you, if each of you could comment on what's one of the most significant barriers or challenges um, in your EDMAC experiences or something unexpected that has happened. <laughs> well, uh, can I speak again? This is John. Sure. Um, what, one of the things, of course, is time. Uh, we, we all have little too little of it. Uh, my students, of course, are full-time students, and so uh, during the school year, we, we tend to have much better mapping during the fall, winter, and spring. But this past winter, we had a lot of snow here, and so there's time and weather, uh, but also the, the, uh, the, the biggest hurdle has, has, has perhaps been uh, a good one, and that is simply getting the students up to understanding how to take a strike and dip. Are we looking at which limestone, which sandstone? But that's all good, uh, but it does, it, it, it's not something that you can do in an afternoon. It, it, it does take a, a, a while to get them ready to go. So I'll say that about that. Yeah, this is Randy. The um, one thing I've noticed as the administrator to the program um, over hundreds and hundreds of these projects over the years is that obviously things come up. And with students, uh, students come and go. Things happen. Um, so a lot of professors will start out with a project. Let me just say this. It's a professor who is the principal investigator. It's the university professor that puts the proposal together because we know that uh, you know there could be problems with students um, and where they go afterwards. It's just easier to be able to do it with the professor. Uh, so you know, it often happens, things come up that, uh, that the student can't finish a project. And we work very closely with the PI to make sure that they uh, can find another student maybe to take over that project. It's not always easy, because it's, it generally takes a special student um, to do one of these projects. Yeah, I, I would echo uh, what John said. Uh, time and weather, I think, is, is a, a big factor, at least it has been on the projects that I've worked with. Uh, an interesting, um, uh, unique problem that, it, it wasn't necessarily a problem, but uh, something that came up 
uh, this summer that was fairly unique. Uh, the project we're doing uh, requiring actual sampling of the, the land, we, we needed to get lots of land ownership uh, permissions. And uh, in the area where we were sampling, it's, it's a fairly high popula populated area. And so that was an interesting challenge of actually uh, getting um, enough landowners to actually agree uh, to let us put a hole in their in their lawn. I'll say that that second that the getting the uh, the permission of landowners to to go onto their ridges and hillsides and looking for outcrops is is also a part of what we do here in Virginia as well. So we've got another question from the audience asking about um, what can go into proposals. Um, Randy, this one might be something for you here. It says, can a successful proposal include funds for supporting work, for example, sending out samples for geochemical analyses, if the instrumentation is not available at the um, institution from where the proposal is coming? Absolutely. Um, we realize, and I think uh, one of the points I want to make is listening to John's talk and also Alan's, that geologic mapping is science. It's not just going out and making a map. There's a lot of science that goes in, and it's, you know, the culmination of putting that map together is the understanding of Earth history. So to be able to make the best of that, it requires uh, things like um, age dating. Um, Alan mentioned the OSL dates that he got for his projects and how important that was. Um, and it's just in so many different ways. Um, John showed thin sections. You know, you, these are tools that we as geologists and scientists need to have to make that map that much more useful and accurate. So absolutely. And another question we've got for everyone is, what are the other skill sets besides geologic knowledge do you look for in prospective students, such as do you look for teamwork or people that can handle the outdoor rigors of geologic mapping, any other skill sets or attributes that you look for when you're, when you're recruiting students to these projects? Well, that, I'll answer that one for first because I'm, I'm the recruiter uh, in my department here right now. I, I look for yes and yes on the teamwork and on the, uh, the uh, outdoor uh, person. Uh, don't, don't, doesn't work too well to have someone who doesn't want to deal with mosquitoes in the summertime or uh, cold weather in the winter. But uh, there, there are those, those uh, persons who sort of have heard now that now we're to the point where the students also do some self-selecting. And I, maybe, Alan, you've seen that as well. Yeah, um, I think so. I, I think one of the things that, um, one of the reasons why uh, maybe at KU we've had some pretty successful projects is because uh, the students that tend to be in these projects are students that take some sort of invested interest in the project, and so it's a project that they, they, they want to do, they want to see through, and they want to see an end product. And so I, I, I think in terms of, of recruiting and looking for certain students. I, I think it's it's important to have students that actually want to become invested in the project and, and perhaps are just not looking for the summer job or, or whatnot. Uh, also, I think um, because technology has gotten to the point where, where these maps uh, are mainly being produced digitally, as Randy, Randy said, I know that uh, there's an undergrad working now that is, um, um, I wouldn't, maybe not a master in uh, ArcGIS is the, the correct word, but he's great and he can do more with uh, systems and those things than I could ever do. And, and so I think that's definitely a plus skill set um, in a student as well. Yeah, let me just second that. I'm, I'm, I'm back to the day of putting strike and dips on a piece of paper. <laughs> and so I, I have a student who is essentially our, our go-to gal in the lab because, of, again, like you said, Alan, her comfort and knowledge with using Illustrator and the ARC systems and digital digital mapping. So I, I'm relying heavily on her. Okay, and we've got one final question for today's webinar, and that is, are there any um, hot topics that are currently being looked for um, for the EdMap program, and also how many students can be funded on a single proposal? I'll take that one. Um, 
Uh, the second part uh, first, um, usually uh, projects are either single students up to maybe four or five at most. And the reason that is there is not necessarily a, a set number of students. But the idea behind EdMap is that one-on-one -on -one mentorship, that mentoring that the professor is having with the students. So I think once you get up uh, past four or five students, um, that one-on-one -on -one business starts to, starts to slack off a little bit. Uh, as far as what, what's being looked for for EdMap, project, it's wide open. It's such a huge, geology is such a huge, huge field. And the cool thing these days is that there, you know, things are changing. There's always something going on societally that really makes, um, makes us look at what we're doing. Uh, uh, we need to look at it a little bit differently. And so the thing I'd bring up now is climate. Obviously, climate change is a huge topic these days. And geologic mapping, mostly of same surficial deposits or even bedrock from older times where we can understand um, the, the changes in environment due to climate, um, would be very uh, useful to what, to what we're doing. But also, there's many projects that are related to energy issues um, or, or really the, or just a lot of the basic science questions that need to be answered. Great. And Randy, you said that um, EdMap applications are due on November 10th this year, correct? That's correct. It's due, uh, see, I think that's uh, Wednesday, November 10th is the uh, closing date. And it's 3 o'clock Eastern time. Okay. Um, and proposals, that is a very hard set uh, deadline. Okay. Well, great. And that's all the questions that we've got for today's webinar. Um, for the participants, if you've got any questions that weren't addressed today's, at today's webinar, you can email them to us at workforce at agiweb.org, and I'll make sure that we send your questions along to the speakers so they can get back to you on a one-to-one -one basis. And we'll go ahead and post today's recorded webinar on our GEO webinar site soon, so you can definitely check back on the site. Um, the website is listed here at the bottom of the screen, www.agiweb.org slash workforce slash webinars.html. Um, you can visit the website to view this webinar as soon as we get it posted, as well as any previous ones that we've hosted over time, and also check out the schedule for upcoming webinars. Um, we'll also be posting the speaker's presentations on the website once we post this webinar today, too, so you'll be able to download and look at those a little bit more in depth. And just to let you know, next month we will be having a GeoConnection Careers webinar called Geoscience, Geoscientists in the Finance Sector. That will be on October 14th, and you can pre-register online by visiting our GeoWebinar site. And I just want to thank Alan and John and Randy today for taking the time to present about EdMap. Um, it's been a great webinar. I really appreciate you having, having you guys uh, present today. So that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you all. All right. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.